Now let's lift up our hands and magnify the Lord together, everybody. Lift them up high with your voice and let's magnify the Lord. I love you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I bring honor to you tonight, Lord. Oh, wonderful friend, I love you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I have no qualifiers, nor do I have any disclaimers to bring to this pulpit tonight. I'm here by invitation. I'm here by calling and by the merits of the grace of God. There has already been exemplified in this meeting today, yesterday, last evening, and Wednesday evening. There is great liberty in this pulpit. That is because this meeting has been hosted by a praying pastor and by previous preaching. There are some things that have been broken from this pulpit. I have no doubt tonight, standing here in this position to minister to this very gracious congregation, that there is liberty in this, whole, in this pulpit. I feel it here right now. But I am as interested tonight in liberty and anointing in the congregation as I am liberty and anointing in this pulpit. The congregation that has come to this meeting, for the most part, has come here with a sincere hunger, a desire, and an interest in spiritual things. The congregation of this size and a meeting of this kind, the congregation is in flux crowd that comes during the day may not return at night for various reasons and uh, vice versa. And so we have gathered here tonight a conglomerate of men and women, apostolic people for the most part, hungering after the things of God. I want us to reach up together sincerely. I want you to hear me just a moment. I want us to reach up sincerely and pray that God would send into the midst of this congregation a great hunger and a great liberty and a great anointing to feel after the Lord tonight. If you came here to visit and to play, I'm sorry. You're going to be a hindrance and not a help. But if you came here to give to God and to receive from the Lord, I feel like there are people in this congregation tonight that will go home different than what they came in. I feel the Holy Ghost. What I'm doing right now, I feel like God spoke to my heart to do. I want us to pray for ourselves and for one another that great utterance to the Spirit will be given to all of us. Let's pray. Dear God, unashamedly, unabashedly, we come to you rendering our hearts Come to minister in this meeting, Lord. The thread that has run through it has provoked us. We are stand convicted, O oh God, hungering after you in the depth of your spirit. One more time, God, we are gathered in this house under the auspices of your calling. We're asking you, God, to pour out an anointing upon each of us in the congregation, in the sections, God, that are on each side of this pulpit. And upon this platform tonight, God, pour out the Holy Ghost with hunger upon us. Let your Spirit, God, have the preeminence. Bind every devil. Bind every wandering mind. Bind every spirit that would hinder. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, let it start like a river, O oh God and flow through this place, removing everything that's not like you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. 
in Jesus' name, let us submit ourselves to the Lord right now. Come on, let us submit ourselves to the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise. Turning in our Bibles tonight to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16, beginning at verse number 14, and reading several verses of Scripture in our hearing tonight. Let me say it as succinctly as I know how to say it, and as carefully, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Brother Bass. Thank you, Congregation of Ocala. Thank you, brethren, who have worked together with Brother Bass to sponsor such a meeting as this. Thank you, brethren, who have preached to my soul. And did I not have this opportunity to stand here tonight, I will tell you of a truth. It has been worth the journey and worth all the effort. I feel like I am going home changed by the preached Word of God and by the Spirit working with us. For Samuel chapter number 16, beginning at verse number 14, the Word of the Lord says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God that troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is cunning, uh, who is a cunning player on an heart. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, uh, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, and a mighty man, a uh, valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse, and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread, and a bottle of wine, and a kid, and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul, and stood before him, and he loved him greatly. And he became his armor-bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an heart and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Let me make a prefacing remark tonight, if I might. I do not believe, number one, that the spirit that came upon Saul was the spirit of God. I know the text is rendered an evil spirit from God, but it was an allowance by the Lord. The Lord is not an evil God. He does not put evil upon men. I'm talking about a spirit that is evil. But the Lord backed up from this man, Saul, and into that vacuum came an evil spirit. Number two, I do not believe that a well can bring forth bitter or salt water and sweet. I do not believe that you can have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, be filled with the power and the glory of the Lord, and have a devil in your life. That is charismatic New Age garbage. I do not believe that. I do not believe that. You're going to have one or the other. You cannot have both at the same time. Somebody said amen. But I am going to preach tonight by the help of God that there are some spirits in this world that are interested in dominating and overthrowing the apostolic church. If you'll help me preach tonight, would you shout amen? God bless you and uh, you may be seated. We are involved in a spiritual battle. I'm not going to take the time to try and to qualify 
all of these things because I don't feel like time will allow me to do so. But long before it became popular in the charismatic world to talk about spiritual warfare, the true apostolic church understood that we are involved in a spiritual battle. I didn't say a struggle because we are not struggling, but we are in a battle. I would suggest to us tonight that we are not passive, uninvolved bystanders, but we are deeply involved in this spiritual battle, particularly we who still love this apostolic message and the beauty that the Lord has placed in His church. Praise God. The spirit of a man is that battleground of great spiritual conflict. It is in that spirit of a man that right is separated from wrong. Good triumphs over evil, or there is a struggle between the two. Truth or false doctrine must battle in the spirit of a man, and godliness and carnal nature must battle in the spirit of a man. Ephesians 6 and 12 tells us emphatically, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so I am contending tonight at SCORE Conference 2002 that we are at the behest, if you please, of two forces alone. I am not going to talk about our human nature that can make the decision, for I tell you today that the battle is not about us, but the battle is about truth. The battle is about godliness. The battle is about Him. The battle is about His message, His church, His people. Praise the Lord. And our submission of one to the other spirit makes all the difference in the world. Amen. In this battle. Praise the Lord. In the book of Romans, the sixth chapter and verse number uh, 13, it speaks about neither yield your members uh, uh, to unrighteousness, but to yield our members unto God. Romans 6 and 16 talks to us about who we do yield our members to, we become servants to obey, whether to sin or whether by obedience unto the Lord. The Bible tells us in John 12 and 31, John 14 and 30, John 16 and 11, speaking the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there is a prince of this world. In Ephesians 2 and 2, the Bible speaks to us of the prince of the power of the air. Jesus said it. Uh, it was written in the book of Luke chapter 4. And I saw it today while Brother Pixler was preaching to us that Satan said that all the power that he was offering unto the Lord Jesus Christ, he said it was given unto me and to whomsoever I will give it. I suggest to us tonight that there is an adversary that opposes the apostolic church. I suggest to us there is an adversary that opposes this apostolic message. I suggest to us tonight that in order for us to have real apostolic church, even in a place like this, there had to be prayer. There had to be consecration. There had to be devotion. There had to be a single-mindedness about the things of God. For we did not just walk into this building tonight and plug into glory world, if you please. But we came into here where there already was some groundwork laid and some men that stood behind this sacred desk and they preached with the authority of God's anointing and God's word and it broke some things loose around here. Thank God for the battle and thank God for the prevailing spirit that comes upon
upon the apostolic church. I've got good news to bring to somebody tonight. We're not dying. We're not sinking. We're not falling apart. We're not giving up. We're not turning back. But we are still in the battle. We're still fighting for the right. And we will try up in Jesus' name. Our God is King of kings, and He is Lord of lords. He holds all power in the palm of His hand. He can speak the words, and worlds come into existence. He can gather together the finite dust, and He can breathe His supernatural breath, and it will become a living soul. He can speak to the winds, and they will obey Him. He can touch the sick body, and it will be healed healed by Him. He can bring the sin sick out of the gutters of sin. He can put conviction upon them. He can give liberty in an altar. He can bless them with His Spirit. He can make saints out of drunkards. He can make saints out of fornicators. He can make saints out of idolaters. He can make saints out of the poorest of the poor. We're not on the losing side. We're on the winning side. We've got victory through Jesus Christ. We have anointing through His blood and His power and His name. All power in heaven and earth still resides in Him. I'm here to tell you tonight, I'm glad that I'm part of the apostolic church. Don't look for me to feel sad. Don't look for us to tuck our head. Don't look for us to have sunk shoulders and say it's too hard. But look for us to go on. Look for us to go up. Look for us to have a move of the Holy Ghost. My Bible still tells us, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. And the powers that be are ordained of God. I'm here to tell you tonight, while there is an opposing spirit, amen, in this world, there is a great, big, wonderful God who's got him on a leash, who's got him on a limited rope, who tells him where to come and when to go, I've got a God tonight that is great, and He is greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Our text tells us tonight, I do want to just back up a moment and say this, that while I do not believe that you can have a devil and the Holy Spirit of God indwelling you at the same time. I do believe in demonic possession. I thought last night as I heard our good brother Lambeth relate that story and it thrilled me to my soul. And every preacher that's preached for very long at all could talk about a similar set of circumstances. There are real devils that do possess. And I'm going to tell you there are real devils that are influencing spirits. I said they are influencing spirits. Praise the Lord. Our text tells us about the first king of Israel. A man selected by God himself had to be found hidden among the stuff. And the Bible tells us that the Lord began to speak to him. An oil of anointing was poured upon his head. And the Lord, through the prophet Samuel, prophesied over him of things that would come to pass. And indeed they did come to pass. In chapter 10, he speaks to Saul and said that the Lord is going to turn thee into another man. The Bible tells us that the prophet said the Spirit of God would come upon him. And indeed in verse number 10, he spoke and prophesied and the Spirit of God came upon him. From obscurity to prominence, 
This man went back home with the lost asses, and he stayed there at home for a season. But one day an enemy by the name of Nahash, an Ammonite, lifted up his voice. I will take the left or the right thumb. I will cut off the big toe, and I will pluck out the right eye of every man in Israel. Well, you got to fight. Saul rose up in his rightful high place. He slew a bullock and sent the pieces around to all the people of God. And the Bible said they gathered together and they went out. And there was a tremendous victory. And before Saul got back home, they had a coronation party where the Bible said that they made Saul the king. He came from obscurity. To prominence, but from his prominence, he made his way to presumptive arrogance. For they said of him, Is Saul among the prophets? There was something that got on that man. There was a noticeable anointing of God that visited his spirit, and the people recognized it. And so it became more than just the buzzword of the day, but it became a proverb unto them is Saul among the prophets. They sing a song of him that Saul hath slain his thousands. I believe they were singing that song before David came along because they were loving the deliverance that came at the hand of this man. But it's not long before Paul, Saul, begins to believe his own press. He becomes puffed up in arrogant in his spirit. He becomes haughty in his ways of dealing with God. He becomes presumptive about the anointing that was on him. And he began to use it like it belonged to him and not to God. I want to preach to us tonight by the help of the Holy Ghost that we need to understand what has already been said to us. We are just worms that came out of the gutters of sin. And if there's any good about us at all, it is because the Holy Ghost picked us up and put something in us. This anointing is not mine. This anointing is not theirs. This anointing is not yours. But it belongs to God and upon whom soever He will choose to place it. test came eventually in the form of the Amale Amalekites. And the Bible said that it was a clear commandment given by God and by the man of God. And he was to go out and utterly destroy, wipe off the remembrance from the face of the earth. Saul came back with King Agag, came back with oxen and sheep, came back with the best of the goods. And when Samuel topped that rise... <laughs> To hear the lowing of the oxen and the bleeding of the sheep and to see that crucified a gag mincing around in the midst of the people of God. He got angry about it, rebuked Saul, cut off the man a gag's head and dismembered him in the sight of all the people of God and made a proclamation to Saul when thou was little in thine own sight, when you were small in your own sight. I made you the king over my people, but now I have taken that which belonged to you. I have found another that's after my own heart, and I'm going to give him that anointing. I did not take the time. It crossed my mind, and I forgot it. But from this time, there are many years that transpire before Saul dies and ignominious death at the hands of the Philistines. But you hear this preacher tonight, if God ever reaches down and pronounces, I have removed my anointing from your life, you need to understand it's gone, honey. You may sit on the throne. You may carry on the way you used to. It may look like it used to, but it's 
it's not what it used to be, and it never will be again. What it was, God will turn and find him somebody else that's got a heart and a spirit after him. I fear and tremble tonight. The Lord departed. And when the Lord God departed, an evil spirit came. And from that day forward, everything that Saul did and everything that is written about him, everything was influenced by that evil spirit that came. We understand from the reading of our text that he found temporary relief from his torment. We understand that when David played skillfully on the harp, when he was in the presence of other anointed people, when there was a presence of God that came as a result of somebody else's touch of God, he could feel the old familiar feelings and be at rest and justify himself. But oh, the story is so plain in the Word of God, and it ought to be plain to you and I tonight, just because we come to score 2,000 where somebody has been in the presence of God and we feel the old familiar spirit again. And if you don't feel it in a prayer closet, if you can't feel it in your devotion to God, if you don't find it in your relationship like you used to have, something is dreadfully and horribly wrong. And if you've got any conscience at all before you leave this conference, you'll find yourself a place of repentance and say, God, not just the splash over, not just the anointing of another, but give it to me, God, like I used to have it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Is there anybody hungry for God tonight? <laughs> Is there anybody hungry for God tonight? You're hungry for more than a shout. You're hungry for more than a run. You're hungry for more than a jump. You're hungry for God to talk to your spirit. Would you stand to your feet right now? Would you lift up your hands? Would you cry around unto Him? God means business here tonight. Come on, God means business tonight. If you're not serious, don't flirt with Him right now. It's dangerous. Praise the Lord. I'm going to tell you this tonight. This is too precious to only feel it vicariously. This is too precious to only get it at conference. This is too precious to only get it when your pastor preaches. This is too valuable to only feel it when there's a God-anointed man preaching the Word of God and, and divine favor begins to interrupt the normal flow of, of your life. But, oh, this is much too valuable uh, to play with like a yo-yo on a string, uh, up and down, up and down, uh, amusing ourselves by turning him on and turning him off. Uh, it's far too valuable uh, to play with uh, just because we come uh, into the company uh, of spiritual men and women. Uh, oh, it's got to be in us. Uh, it's got to be on us. Uh, it's got to be through us. Uh, there's got to be liberty in our churches, uh, liberty in our pulpits. Liberty on the pews. Liberty in our cities. Liberty for revival. Liberty for transformation. Liberty for conversion. Liberty for evangelism. Liberty to know God in the fullness of His power. (laughs) 
Please be seated. I'm going to say something here tonight. I've thought about it. I've thought about it before I came. And uh, it's been heavy on my mind the last several days. But as I listened last night again to Brother Lambeth's testimony, demonic possession has become to some, in sometimes to most, in the Pentecostal Apostolic Church, rather a little backward, embarrassing footnote of our trivial, uh, uh, uninitiated, unlearned past. Amen. Or it is relegated to those scary stories that our missionaries tell us because after all, those foreign lands are not sophisticated, neither have they the great liberty that we have. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to pop you a little balloon tonight. Amen. That there is today, as I speak and as we sit in this building tonight, there are demonic forces at work attempting to undermine your relationship with God, to undermine your hope in eternity to take your affection from things above and to focus them on things on this earth there is a concentrated effort of hell and demonic oppression and demonic possession and demonic influence to move us from the calling of our heavenly savior into a trivial pursuit of charismatic renewal but I'm telling you in a meeting uh, such as this meeting, uh, there rises up uh, the strong banner uh, of apostolic preaching uh, that says not in our lifetime, uh, not in this place, uh, not among us, uh, not with this ministry. Uh, we're not giving in to this world. We're not giving in to hell. And we're not going to be defeated. Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 1 paints a word picture for us. Joshua the high priest standing before the Lord. Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the text goes on to tell us that his garments were stained and spotted and filthy. But there was a cleansing touch from a heaven that came upon him. But get the picture in your mind. Uh, uh, the ministry standing uh, before God. Uh, but they're standing at the right hand uh, of the ministry. Is the powers uh, of darkness. Uh, the occult, if you please. Uh, the new age spirit, if you please. Uh, that is attempting to thwart uh, and to tear down uh, and to destroy this ministry. Jesus Christ encountered spirits and devils that cried out against him. 4 and 24 of Matthew tells us, among others, that those that had torments and were possessed with devils and were lunatic were brought to the Lord and he healed and delivered them all. Mark chapter 5 tells us of the demoniac from the Gadarenes that was crying as a wild man and it could not be tamed and the the Bible tells us that when Jesus landed on the shores of Gadara, that this man ran to him and legions were cast out of him. Mark chapter 9, the boy brought by his father is torn, foaming, thrown into the fires to burn him, thrown into the waters, if you please, to drown him, to destroy the potential of the master making a difference in his life but one word from the Lord Jesus made Acts 
chapter 8 of the New Testament ministry of the apostles, many that were possessed with devils cried out with a loud voice and deliverance came to them and there was revival that came and they had to deal with Simon the sorcerer but the spirit identified itself and the apostolic church had to condemn or contend with demonic powers and influences and possessions in people's lives. I submit to you tonight that that has not lessened in the United States of America or around our world with the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But His power and His efforts and His hunger and His anger and His wrath have been intensified against the apostolic church today. Satan has not found himself a hole to climb into. He has not found himself a closet to get into. But woe to the inhabitants of the sea and of the land for Satan has come down having great wrath for he knoweth he hath but a short time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to choke a while and preach a while, but I'm going to get this out. Praise the Lord, somebody. I said the devil's a liar. I said the devil's a liar. He does not want me to preach this way tonight. Revelation 16 and 14 speaks to us of spirits that have been loosed from the bottomless pits of hell. And the Bible calls them spirits of devils. Amen. They go throughout the whole earth. They are there to work miracles and to deceive many. The Bible says the kings of the earth. And to gather them into judgment against our God. I'm telling you tonight, hear me well. In the foundation of this message tonight, that hell is ever more vigilant. He is ever more desirous. He is ever more on the job. I feel like in some ways that the downturn in our economy has been a godsend to the apostolic church for what could have been in some cases has not. And it's thrust men back from their arrogance and their pride to trust God and to believe Him again. I say in a New York second that if that be the will of God that bring it on. I want God more than I want another meal. I want God more than I want any more money. I want God more than I want honor, prestige, or anything else. Listen to me carefully. The characteristics of demonic influence, I believe, are recognizable. Number one, I'm going to give you only four points in this. There could be possibly many more. But four, for sake of the message tonight. The characteristics of demonic influence. Number one, demonic influence upon the life of a man always seeks. To destroy good. I'm telling you it's demonic. When a spirit comes upon an individual and they try to tear down every good thing that a sincere, conscientious saint or preacher would attempt to do. Amen. Saul, when he had enough of David's plane, reached over into his arsenal and picked up from his place by his throne a javelin. And when David played upon the heart, his jealousy and that spirit drove him more than one time to thrust it at David and to attempt to destroy the very thing that was attempting to help him. You better beware of a spirit that always tries to tear down good that's in your life.
don't have time to dwell there at the moment. And I'm going to tell you, 2 Timothy 3.3 3 tells us about the end time attitude that they would be despisers of those that are good. My brethren, when you're preaching this apostolic message and you're hated for it, count it all joy. It's the will of God. And if the devil hates what you're doing, that means you're doing a good job with it. Go ahead, thrust your javelins. We're still going to preach. <laughs> Hate us. Talk about us. It doesn't change our message, and it doesn't hurt our feelings. We've got our mind made up. This is the only God we're going to serve. Number two, when there is demonic possession or influence, there is no constraint. Well, I feel like preaching. I said when there's demonic influence, nobody is going to rate you in. Nobody is going to pull your chain. Nobody is going to be able to help you out. The demoniac Gugabdera, he was bound with fetters, but he shattered every one of them. He was bound with chains, but he broke them. He was bound up in prison, but could not be constrained up there. I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. Paul Timothy again, 2 Timothy 3, the end time spirit, incontinent, traitors, disobedient, truce breakers, will not be constrained. I feel like preaching just a moment here and tell you this tonight. If you're a saint of God that's got a godly pastor that's trying to put good in your life, for God's sake, would you please quit chasing and trying to get loose from an apostolic preacher that wants you to go to heaven. No, man. It's got to be my way. Self-justification. Rejection of the old paths. We accept evil and call it good. There's no constraint in that. Oh, hallelujah. Number three, resist all spiritual authority or correction. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 through 8, speaks about our heavenly Father. We have fathers after the flesh that for our own benefit corrected us and brought us to go into justice for our evil deeds. How much more our heavenly Father is going to bring upon us chastening rods, scourging, and rebuke. There is only one reason that a gracious God would do that. And that is because He loves us enough that He wants to correct our way. But oh, this generation I'm talking about tonight uh, doesn't want to be constrained. Uh, the first little uh, rattle out of the box uh, when the going gets tough. Uh, the first thing in their mind uh, is the flesh pot they came out of uh, and the hell hole they crawled out from. Uh, hear me tonight. Uh, don't go back to your sin. If there's correction in your life, take it. Uh, love it. Uh, appreciate it. Say God for it, and you can be saved with it. Hallelujah. Number four, characteristic of demonic influence, oppression, or possession, is that it's always, it's always, it always produces sensuality. Well, that hit like a rock. 
that fell over like lead. I'm going to tell you, you want to see the spiritual influence, amen, of an ungodly spirit. Just take a look at the sensuality that's going on in our ranks. I'm going to tell you, it's on men as well as women. It's on the aged as well as the young. I didn't lose anything in Hollywood. I didn't lose anything in its style. I didn't lose anything in its ungodliness. When I came out, I was glad to get out. And I don't want to go back. I thought you'd be shouting by now. Look at it for yourself. Be seated. Hey Amen. I can't tell you the times I've seen it happen. Folks come in out of a world of sin. I'm thinking of a young lady in our church right now. Her father's a Baptist minister. Vicki was raised in a Baptist preacher's home. But she hated every moment of it. She said it was, my dad was a phony. I couldn't feel God. And she rebelled. Went out into a world that debauched sin. She would, became the worst of the worst. But she took a job down at the local auto parts store. Somebody in that store said, Vicki, I know what you're looking for. I don't go to that church, but I know where there's a church that can help you find what you're looking for. And they don't even go to the church, but they sent her to the church. And when she came to the church, she got rid of her sensual clothing. She got rid of her sensual attitude. She got. She used to be one of those instructors down at the spas. You know what I'm talking about. But when she got the Holy Ghost, no more display of her flesh. No more display of carnality. No more display of unreasonable unrighteousness. She fixes her hair to please God and nobody else. She wears her clothes to please God and nobody else. When are we going to learn that that sensual spirit is not of God? Let me give you three ways to invite a devil into your life. Three ways to invite demonic possession. Three ways to, de to invite demonic oppression and influence. Three ways. Praise God. Number one, you have to invite him in. By invitation, you hang around where he is. I tell the young people the church I pastor, it does matter what kind of music you listen to. It does matter where you hang out. It does matter where you go and find your pleasure. Brother Hurley, it does matter who your friends are. It does matter what you play with, what you entertain yourself with. It does matter because you're going to hang around something that's got a hell all over it. And you can play with it. And you can invite it into your life. And you can become possessed by a devil. I felt something tick back right there. I'm going to say it again. You can play with something while you're singing in the choir. You can play with something while you're preaching in the pulpit. You can play with something while you're running the aisle. And you can become possessed. He caught on the Sata. He caught on the He caught on the Number two, you can become demon-possessed or spiritually influenced by rebellion against God-given authority. I said you can become demon-possessed 
my rebelliousness against God, sanctioned, God ordained, spiritual authority in your life, you can become possessed of a devil. I feel fear on me tonight. I feel the Holy Ghost dunking on me tonight. I feel God in this house. When that prophet Samuel came and he looked at Saul, he said these words. He said, for rebellion is as witchcraft. Well, the preacher across town don't deny, don't deny us this. I don't like the way you're doing it. I'll go over where they allow it. My parents really don't understand me. And it's a new generation. Honey, you better get in your mind. When you rebel against God's authority in your life, you are open. I wish somebody would pray right now sincerely. Come on, is that all we got? Come on, pray. Number three, and this is scary to me. Please be seated and hear me. But the third way that an individual can become, can come under the influence of demonic spirits is to develop in them a passivity towards spiritual things of God. I'm sorry, but we do not contend that church membership and putting your tithe and offering in the plate qualifies you to have done all that there is to do in your pursuit after God. For He said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of the heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. You hear me tonight. The apostle said, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. You did not. I did not. We did not get the Holy Ghost to sit on the pew and pick up a Laodicean spirit. And I'm okay. You're okay. As long as you come. No. There's got to be a hunger a thirsting, a desire for spiritual things. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 43 says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, it walketh in dry places seeking rest, and finding none, then he returneth unto the vessel from which he came, and findeth it swept, empty, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh seven spirits worse than himself. And the latter end of that man is worse than at the beginning. There is no place in this spiritual work there for casual apathy in the kingdom of God. You're either marching with him or you're standing still and headed backwards. There is no place to stop, to sit down, and to quit.
Hallelujah. All of that, all of that was only a foundation. And I'm about to quit, but I'm going to preach by the help of the Lord. In the next few minutes, what I feel is the reason for all the foundation. I contend that much of Jesus' name Pentecost has come under the influence of demonic spirits because somewhere in the areas that have been mentioned here tonight, they have given up the battle. I don't know why. I don't have the reasons to tell you why. I only contend tonight that we are observing demonic influence in men of leadership, men that pastor churches and congregations that still call themselves Jesus' name apostolic, but they are the farthest thing from purity, righteousness, holiness before God, or desire for spiritual things. Their God has become their appetite. Their God has become their world. They are in idolatry, has been mentioned here today, because they serve not God, but they serve their own appetites. And I'm here to contend that in store 2002, that God has a word for this conference. It's been throughout this conference. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and He will exalt us. Whole churches have gone the way of sin. Whole ministries are being destroyed, have become tools in the hands of the devil. Pulpits have been shackled, and puppets now occupy the pulpit with no spiritual discernment. Getting their cue from charisma, getting their cue from the Trinitarians, getting their cue from the Dylan Dallas that's building a big church that's got all the silly folks gaga. I tell you, I'm not impressed. Give me an apostolic. Give me a man of God, not a phony. I feel like I lost you. I feel like you checked out on me. I feel resistance to this tonight. I'm going to preach it anyhow. Some areas, whole movements are given over to another spirit. Deny it if you can. I'm not a smart aleck. Oh God, I'm going to tell you it's been beaten out of me until I'm not a smart aleck. But I'm telling you I'm worried and I'm preaching tonight with a passion and a burden. Amen. There are places where good is destroyed routinely. If they knew this meeting was going on, they would stand uh, together in little cups and groups uh, and they would mock and deride the things uh, that had been preached here. Uh, let a man raise up uh, and proclaim the whole counsel of God uh, and they'll see to it he never gets another pulpit. They'll see to it he never gets another revival. I want to say this to you evangelists. Uh, you need to be God's man. Uh, you need to pray until you hear from God uh, and then please uh, preach the whole counsel of the Lord and don't leave us in our ignorance uh, to go to hell. I'll right, right. say to preachers, if our tithe on Monday morning means more to us uh, than the favor of God, please resign your church. Uh, please go get you a job selling something. Please don't stand in judgment of God. In many areas of Pentecost, they are unrestrained. Dare you lift your voice against television, they'll shoot you full of bullets. Dare you say that the movies are wrong, and they will kill you and cut your throat. Dare you say that jewelry and the wearing of baubles and such as that is not in the Word of God, and opposes the pure spirit of holiness, and they'll cut your water. But dare you get up and tell the young men, would you please quit trying to be like the latest Hollywood idol, and become like a real apostolic in moderation, and they'll look at you like you lost your mind. 
if you get up and say, please, you young ladies, uh, you're causing men to lust by your tight clothing uh, and by your immodest apparel uh, and by your fierce out looks. Uh, you're causing men to lust in their heart. Uh, they'll say, that's your problem uh, and not mine. Uh, unrestrained. Uh, try to take away their immodest clothing uh, and they'll fight you with a ravenous desire. Uh, try to take away their sports world uh, and they'll hate you for it. Uh, they're out unrestrained. Uh, nobody can rule them in. Uh, nobody can preach to them. Uh, nobody can help them. Let's pray again, sincerely. Come on, hell don't want me to preach this way. I feel strong resistance rising and I don't understand it. Come on, church, would you rise up and fight? Come on, you apostolics, would you please, please begin to call on the Lord. Would you cry out with a loud voice to Him? God is looking for a people that will be zealous for good works, hungry for His Spirit. In Jesus' name, come on, church, rise up and pray. Rebellion runs rampant. Try to get them into the service. Try to get them into the meetings. Try to get them to dress right and to live right. They'll spit in your eye. They call the preachers by the first name. They mock their messages. They make fun of their worship. They mock them in their desire for holiness. They withhold their tithe and their offering, trying to starve them out. Honey, a God called man will get a raven from a heaven and a crumb that will never cease and meal that will never run dry. A brook that runs in drought time. You hear this preacher tonight. Don't get that kind of spirit in your life a rebellion some of you don't like the way I'm preaching right now I made a promise to God I would not interject myself tonight but it is sure is tempting right now why don't you like this why is this foreign to your ears why are you upset by this what spirit are you of? What's motivating you? Doesn't it ever cross your mind that you're listening to the wrong influence? Sensual. And it's across the board. It's across the board. Men and women. Men and women. Young man sat in my living room late one night when we were talking, claiming to be a, a preacher of the gospel. And I made this simple statement that I do not believe that each generation has its style of music. That I believe there's only one form of worship that's pure and true and that God will receive. And that's heartfelt. Amen. Music that does not edify the flesh but glorifies God. And that young man took umbrage with me. And we sat there in my home. And you know, I'm a very passive man. And I'm easily intimidated. And I'm easily cowed. And I never ever speak my mind. You know that's the kind of man I am. If you've been around me very much, something got on me. I got angry. A spirit rose up in me. And until about 2 a.m. in the morning, I said, you sit right there. You're not leaving this house. I'm going to have a talk with you. Amen. I do not believe it. I stand here tonight and tell you that my generation did not have a form of music and this generation of young people have another form no sir the only thing that pleases our God is what I've already mentioned let your praise be unto him I was with a couple of preachers recently one of whom is here tonight 
When a preacher said, I told the old folks, or I told the young people to go half their concert and half their music, that all the old fogies would not be allowed to be there. And if they wanted to, quote, dance all night and tear it up, it was all right, get as loud as they wanted to get. And that came from a preacher. I'm going to tell you tonight, not in God's economy. Is rebellion ever acceptable? But real obedience to his spirit. Amen is what God wants from all of us. As God has true prophets for such a time as this, so I believe that Satan has men that are available in this generation. Jesus said, beware of the leaven. Beware of the doctrine of the Sadducees. He spoke to us to beware, Paul did, of dogs, of impudent, impure men, individuals. He preached to us to beware of evildoers, of troublesome, of injurious, wicked deceivers. He preached to us to beware of the concision, of that which mutilates and tears down not everything that is good. You listen to me tonight in closing when I tell you that Satan has got some cloak in garments of light, becoming angels of light, transformed into preachers of light when really they are emissaries from a hell and they're trying to take the apostolic movement to hell with them. You might be under the influence if you have forsaken the old landmarks for a compromised life of ease. You might be under the influence of demonic powers if you despise correction from godly men. You might be under the influence of, of demonic powers if you admire the success uh, as defined by Trinitarian charismatics. Uh, you might be under the influence uh, if you are reluctant to proclaim the Acts 238 message uh, and Ephesians 4 and 5. Uh, amen. Uh, the only message of salvation for fear of a Defending your guest, you might be under the influence of demonic powers. You might be under the influence of a devil if you're reluctant to preach about separation from this world for fear of hurting your new converts. You might be under the influence of a demonic power. Amen. If you despise the standards of holiness, you might be under the influence of a devil from hell if you build again the things uh, which you one time destroyed. Oh, God, have mercy. I hope I'm wrong, brethren. I hope I'm wrong. But I feel something working here tonight. I feel resistance, and I don't understand it. God, show me where it's at. I rebuke it in the name of the Lord Jesus. I rebuke it in Jesus' name. Break this spirit tonight, God. Break this carnal spirit tonight, God. Break this carnal spirit tonight, God. Reveal it in this house tonight, God. Pour out the Holy Ghost on us tonight. I wish the church would pray. I wish the church would call on God. Pray, church. Would you please pray? Do you want old time Pentecost? Would you please get in the spirit of prayer? Where are the intercessors? The Lord promised me there'd be intercessors in this house tonight. Where are those who wail and bewail sin? Where are those who will hate the very appearance of evil? Where are you tonight? They will say, God, feel free to correct me anytime I need it.
you might be under the influence if you can sin without remorse. Your conscience doesn't smite you. This is such a hell-bent generation. You know, brethren, immorality is just not, not shameful anymore. Young men and young women, folks can cheat on their husband or wife. They can leave the sacred vows of marriage and run around just to fulfill the lust of their flesh and feel absolutely no remorse, but feel like if I had been better taken care of by my husband or my wife, I would not have fallen into this trap. You shameless individual, you. Your husband or wife had nothing to do with it. You came under the influence by your dabbling with carnality of a destructive, damnable spirit of immorality. Oh God, where is our shame? Where is our remorse? Where is our hunger? How come there's so many jokes told in Pentecost that are filthy, vulgar, that are sensual in nature, and nobody weeps? How come our young people can shout in the choir and fornicate in the backseat of an automobile and nobody discerns it until it's too late? You might be under the influence of an evil spirit. If I've ever preached in the Holy Ghost, I'm preaching in the Holy Ghost to this conference tonight. Feel strong that there's folks here tonight. You're closer. You're closer to demonic oppression or even possession than you even know you are. You ought to plead the mercies of the Lord right now. Let's honor him. You might be under the influence of a devil. If you try to cover sin without shame, you might be under the influence of a demon if you refuse to confess until confronted with irrefutable evidence. I'm convinced tonight that there are many churches hindered because in the pulpit, in the pew, there are many that are of another spirit. I feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. I feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. How do I get loose from it? Number one, you resist the devil and he will flee from you. Stop doing what you're doing. Stop going where you're going. Listen to me. Hear me. Pray, but, but hear me. Church, do your best to get a hold of God. Resist the devil. Don't go those places. If you can't handle the internet, get it out of your home. It'd be better for you to throw your computer away. Go back to the abacus than to have a tool in your home that will take you to hell. Hey Amen. Hear me tonight. Resist the devil. Resist the devil. Number two, let every will be subject under the higher power. Submit yourself to the preaching of the word. Submit yourself to a man of God. Crawl on your hands and knees if you have to. But get to God and get to the man of God and say, forgive me, I'm sorry. Forgive me, I'm sorry. i got to be saved. Confess your sin. Mark 9 tells us this kind cannot come forth except by prayer and by fasting. 
down. We want to shout it down nowadays. We don't want to pray it down. We want to jump it down. We don't want to pray and fast. Fasting is relegated for just a couple of meals a month or a couple of meals in a year. But where are the apostolics that look on this world of ungodliness and a landscape of apostolic Pentecost that is bereft of the touch of God? They will say, I'm not eating and I'm not going to eat again until God touch God. Where are the people that will pray and seek the Lord? I feel God talking to us tonight. Listen to me as I close tonight. If you found yourself anywhere in this service tonight under the influence of another spirit, I beg you in the fear of God, would you step out from where you are, whoever you are. I don't care if you had the Holy Ghost. I don't care if you're pastoring a church. This is not a night to worry about appearances. This is a night to come to an old-fashioned altar and a prayer meeting and say, I'm not leaving here till I'm changed. I'm not leaving here till I'm changed. Come on. I'm making an appeal right now. I'm appealing to young men. I'm appealing to married couples. I'm appealing to young ladies that are fighting a spirit of sensuality. I'm appealing to old men and women that are fighting a spirit in your life that you can't overcome.